He's absolutely Jason, he's absolutely gay He'll absolutely brighten up the darkest rainy day He's funny and loves movies, he's smart and he's a Jew He's an actor and an activist and wants to hear from you Hey everybody, welcome to Absolutely Jason Stewart. I'm very excited. Tonight, or today, or this afternoon, or whenever you're watching the show, I have uh, an old friend and a new friend, Mark Brazil. Welcome. Comedian and showrunner, writer, producer. You directed a little too? No. You never directed any of the episodes? No interest in that. Oh gosh, I thought you did, because you have that tone. I, th I, I, I should have I think insurance. you should, because then I'll tell you later. So, this is what happened, and I... I, I uh, Mark and I worked together as stand-ups a million years ago when we first started out. You looked completely different. Yeah. I mean, completely. Here you look like some dad that... Ha that you, you kids, come on! Your mom's waiting! Which I became. Yes. But then I looked like a really uh, like you beautiful of, girl. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a problem. You looked like you walked out of Woodstock. Uh, yeah, I had And then when hair. I saw you, we were doing Fraser Smith radio show. It was you, me, Randy Kagan. Oh my God! Look at this. See, that's after I cut the hair. That is even. That's even trying to look a little more conservative, and you're rocking a little bit of a mullet. Just I had a mullet. a mullet, man. I don't know why. So did I. It's weird. Everybody had a mullet. It was like spray the, you know, spray it like this on the sides. It really loves, and then pull it over. And Patrick Swayze Roadhouse. God bless him. Yeah, it was the um, Randy and I talked about the mullet. How the the man bun is the mullet. Oh yeah. You will be embarrassed. Oh, not embarrassed, mortified, mortified. shame. Yeah, that's like the. So there'll alt, be a twelve-step program for it. I'm thinking that alt-right haircut where they shave the sides of their head. Oh, please! I wish they would put a bullseye there to just make it easier to punch. It. <laughs> I just think you know. Obviously, you've gone back to stand up. Yes, which is really sort of cool. It's and I think, great. And, it, and it's sort of fun for you. Yeah, it's really fun. And, and you uh, live in the valley, right? Uh, I live in uh, out Glendale. Oh, you know? that way. Okay, because I'm doing the Van Nuys Comedy Club tonight. Oh, nice. You should, at 9 o'clock, so if anybody's around, come, come, come down. Um, it's a you know, sort of local kind of little kind of gig to try out new material and do stuff. But um, look, I'm giving him gig advice right here on, on the show in front of him. Well, I need it. Believe me. Uh, call me and I'll give you whatever you want. Okay. Um, my friend Ida Rodriguez is going to give me a really cool uh, list soon. You know she's one of my really good friends, too. I did not know oh. that. See, there's some, she, this is what happened. I she say told this. me a story. Is, I'll tell you the story. Yeah, you told me the story. I'm going to tell you what happened. So I went there, and I know Randy for years. Randy Kagan was there. He's coming on the show next week. You have this sort of gentle kind of thing. You have this way. I can tell that I should be working with you. I can tell that we would do something. I could tell that I, could, I would feel comfortable. You remind me of, of um, oh, God, on The Closer. When I guess started on The Closer, there was a guy that was so terrific, uh, Mike Robin. And I think you just have that thing where you, I, I could see why, Folks at home, that '70s show, which was your show, 200 episodes, yeah, which is insane. I was because that doesn't happen yeah. to very few people, and you have that. I can see why the show was so successful and people wanted to be there. I'm I'm still amazed that it's on so much every single day. No, I'm not. Well, it's been 10 years though. Because we it, haven't made a new one in 10 years, and there's an and, affection to it. There's an affection to show that people it was it was part of the American culture, you know, in the 90s. And it spawned so many great careers. Yeah. So that was lightning in a bottle. How did how, so the, the that cast? Uh, well, I, I guess let's talk about. It. I'm just thinking how to start. So um, we'll talk about it and get it out of the way. That '70s show was basically a takeoff on what we were doing in the '70s. I'm assuming it from Brady Bunch, Partridge Family. Well, Happy Days. Happy Days. That kind of show. Which is it's kind of interesting, the Happy Days connection. I lived in Toluca Lake forever, and, uh, and I wound up building a horse ranch in Ojai and bailing out on everything for um, seven years. But because so you actually left comedy? Oh, I left everything. Wow. I would do a pilot here and there with uh, Warner Brothers, but for the most part I was just... As a writer or as a... Writer, creator. Uh -huh. You know, I did a... Um, actually, I think I've done three or four pilots over the last 10 years almost always with tom warner and peter roth you know those were the guys that i had relationships with I'm from carsey warner yeah wow and um and i love i love peter roth i mean he bought 70s people don't remember that but he was the president of fox talk right in there so he was the president of fox he bought 70s in 98 and uh they they he left and went to warner brothers um so you know 
it was uh, doing those pilots. I did a pilot with that was based on Chelsea Handler. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because Chelsea... She doesn't seem like your sense of humor. She is a lot like... Really? Yeah, because I read all her books, and I was like, okay. they There were two people developing at the same time. Uh, one of the shows was the one where Laura Prepon, coincidentally, played her. Yes. And she played her sister. But the one I wrote, based on what I'd read, um, it was uh, Chelsea in uh you know her vacation i think the hamptons or something like that where her family owned a house not a, you know right a, a very normal family though you know if you read any of her books you realize well she's well, brilliant but she's also kind of filthy she's, un she's unfolding she's yeah. somebody that came in so brash and so quick and people were just wanting to have a woman i think and i think that people gave her a bad trip because basically she was in she had, was in a relationship with the head of E, and that's how that happened. And that doesn't mean that she isn't good. No. You know? I mean, believe me, I have every job because someone liked me as a person sometimes more than they w believed in me as, a, as an actor or a comedian, I'm thinking. So that doesn't bother. How you get in doesn't matter. And she just, her show just, you know, blew up. And she just blew up. And I think, and she's also been a great supporter of other people. Yeah. Other comedians. Oh, she broke so many comics. Yeah. By... Uh, because it used to be you do the Tonight Show, you're famous. Things change. You have to do Chelsea for a year, then you can book yourself all over the country. You know, I don't know if it's going to be... No, they be... told me I was too old. <laughs> you're younger than her, though, aren't you? I hope. So Chelsea, it was uh, based on her books. It's a family show, but she is... It's like the Wonder Years with a really filthy 16-year-old girl. 15-year-old <laughs> girl. Because Chelsea developed really early. And in her book, one of her books, she talks about babysitting 17-year-old boys because they all think she's 20. But she's not. She's just a kid. How do you babysit a 17-year-old boy? I don't know. The parents don't want them alone. You know, so it's like she's babysitting people older than her. And so it was kind of like a, a sort of a, a, a female uh, semi-cable uh, wonder years with mm -hmm. Chelsea narrating the stories about her family. So, but instead they went with, uh, you know, the Laura Prepon, uh, Chelsea playing her own sister thing. And it that's just, fine. It, it just but, didn't uh, work because the, the show was not about that. Uh, you should have just put Chelsea in it. Not yes. that Laura's not fantastic. She is. She's but tremendous. Just, She's a great actress. Story. But it's, it was like, uh, I think it would have been easier for Chelsea to just be the one. Oh, you know, of course. Because it was her story. Um, I did a pilot with jason lee he and i wrote a pilot a couple years ago oh man he's great yeah he's tremendous and now i guess he's moved to texas he's still doing pilots so but how he's not on a show well how he's not back in movies yeah i mean that's well, why he, I, yeah. I know him much more from movies than i do from television yeah because well, earl yeah. that was the thing yeah i liked earl but i i thought earl was brilliant and new and what i also loved about earl was that when you would go into audition for that show they'd have i would be auditioning against an 80 year old woman they didn't oh, care that's what brilliant. the person was, and I love that. See, that's all casting should be, you know, oh. it should be blind, you know? It should be uh, no age, no, no gender. Are you getting me rolling no, my eyes, guys? You know, aside from a relationship, if you have a relationship that you want to put in this, you know, place, but for the most part, yeah, it's much better. So the story is stand-up, left the business. Yeah. No, stand-up, television. What was the what was the first big success, and why did you decide to get out of stand up and go and be writer producer guy? Because um, a well, lot of us success, have that uh, people uh, kept telling me to do that. It was Dennis Miller actually. Oh really? Dennis Miller in uh, 1990 or 91 or maybe even 92. It might be at the apex you, of his uh, when his career. You know, I was in uh, Cleveland, the Improv, and he I was did that room. yeah Sarah Nye yeah. was the manager. Oh, of course, and. Um, Sarah wanted me to stay over to open for Dennis for two shows on Monday night. I was supposed to be at Walter Gertz's club, the Improv in Chicago. Uh huh. I did that too. Of course you did. That we was, all, yeah. That was, was the like, one where I came out on. It oh, was the really? First, yeah, it was a big deal. I had done an AIDS benefit there. It was the first time I realized, oh, I can do this and be myself. Wow. It was really a big deal. So it's that, a, such an amazing place, though. Oh, yeah. You know? Chicago's an amazing city. Go ahead. So, yeah, so I, uh, I stayed over. Um, the improv uh, in Los Angeles like well it's going to be 150 to change his flight 
And I said, I'll pay the 150. And Sarah's like, no, we'll take care of it. Uh, I know, always. That's the conversation. Yeah, it's like, it was like, it was like $3,000. But it's the difference between me, uh, who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I stay over. I open for Dennis for two shows. He says, uh, I don't have a show, but if I get one, you should be a writer on it. And I said, okay. And then he got a show. And it was the WGN show that was on every night when Carson was leaving. Oh, it was the show, his own show, before yeah. it was the one that it's, wasn't as successful. It was the one that didn't win all the Emmys. Right. Okay, so um, so that was it. So once I started writing for him, I think I went to, and uh, my ex got pregnant with my son, Jack, who is, you know, I measure everything on the kids. He's, uh, he's born in 93. Uh, my daughter was born in 96. I realized I can't go on the road. I can't keep doing stand-up. So there's been a lot of comedians that have done that, and I yeah, think so I think it I, suffers. I do too. I was I was worried about the relationship. But when, you're, when you're a comedian, you're gone at least two weeks a month. At least I did that for twenty years and yeah. acted. It was insane. And then I wondered why I didn't have a boyfriend. I did it for ten, and I was I was like, I don't think I can. Yeah, it's and it's 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 just it's brutal. So so that was like once once uh, Jack and Eden showed up, I was like, well. I'm just going to write. And so went from Dennis Miller to In Living Color, which was great. In the, be in the beginning years, yeah. So, um, and it was, you know, Jamie Foxx and Jim Carrey and Tommy Davidson. It was tremendous. Tommy's a good friend. Oh, he's I love awesome. Him. He and I wrote together. We created uh, Sweet See, Tooth Jones. Oh, my God. Well, that was a character of his. Lottie forever. Dottie, karate, yes. protecting your body. <laughs> <laughs> that's where i met mark wilmore oh my god um that was really weird too larry wilmore and i competed against each other on star search and then you cut to like however many years later he's running bernie mac and i'm running 70s and we're right next door to each other and we're like yeah life's funny i lost you know? to martin lawrence and uh this is where i am and he's where he is and <laughs> I don't know where Martin is. Yet. We're going to take a break. <laughs> We're going to take a break. We're going to be here with my new best friend, Mark Brazil. We'll be back in just a second. Please don't change that channel. Oh, my God, we don't have channels. I like to sing, dance, pretend, and I like to have fun, 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 I'm Vicki Abelson. Who the fuck is Vicki Abelson? Hello. <laughs> I wrote a book called Don't Jump. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and my fucking mother. Not my mother, Andy Stone's mother. Andy Stone is my heroine, and she was addicted to everything pretty much except heroin. Oh my God, oh yes. She just totally captures the excitement of, of rock stars. And famous athletes and famous comedians sort of an insider's view from the outside. The warmth and wit of Vicky's writing knocked me out I in, in a good way, not, not like Cosby. Too soon? Don't jump. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and my fucking mother. Damn, that was gonna be the name of my book. Vicky wrote a book? Vicki Abelson's long-awaited new book, Don't Jump, is finally here. Don't miss it. Who the fuck is Vicki Abelson? Welcome back to Absolutely Jason Stewart with my guest, Mark Brazil. So, so you went and you 
did all these shows and you decided I'm a writer because I got kids, which I think is really wonderful. And and you sold oh, I, I, that 70s show by just saying, this is, what did you say to me? Uh, it's friends with... It's friends and bell bottoms, yeah. Friends and bell bottoms. And they just said yes. Well, how does know, that how does that work? And then the show goes on. Was it an instant hit? I don't remember. Um, it was because it was between Simpsons and X Files. Oh man! And so they, but then they're like, "Oh, it's a time slot hit." They thought it's it's um, you know, it's like Jesse or Veronica's closet. They said, "You take it out of that spot, it won't work. It won't make right. it." Right. And you know, the two people who said that were, um, well, anyways, a lot of people thought that. And, uh, but it was a real audience show. It was. I think more people in the audience, it wasn't as much of an as industry show as it was an audience show. Am I correct? Yeah, I don't think... People you know, really, it's, it's I mean, the, the never, fans were like obsessed with it. Never got Emmys. Never. I don't think it even... Uh, it won for Wardrobe one year. And which was weird because I was on Third Rock um, Which from was the really, sun. really an Emmy. Uh, it, it, but that show was both. It would, yeah, but... Um, it did win a Golden Globe when I was there, and it uh, it got nominated twice, and we lost to Frazier. That was when Frazier won five years in a row. Everything. But John Lithgow always won. and But uh, John realized, oh, gosh, these guys aren't going to get an Emmy. And he thanked every writer by name when he won because he, he knew. You know, for whatever reason, mm. we were not considered, you know, eloquent I just think or it's, whatever it is it's it's just it's just it, i think there was something about that show that really hit with the american public and i think sometimes the industry has their own taste i don't think it means better or not better so don't forgive right. me if anybody's thinking hey why do you bring that up i think there are two different kinds of shows and sometimes you hit it with one and sometimes you hit it with another and that's just the way it is and it doesn't matter because they're both equally uh important you know? yeah some shows are, are super popular used to be you'd watch them and go eh, it's not mine. but for whatever reason because i think it was on fox and it probably didn't get the same amount also, of attention yes because yes. it was the new you, you, fox wasn't what it is now it's a part of the whole thing it was, right it would still had only been on for you know a short amount of time yeah uh Carsey warner actually came to me w after the the turner said we whatever we do next we want to do with mark because I had created a show wow, for Wow, what does Tom. that feel like? It was pretty good. Yeah, I wasn't, you look I wasn't unhappy shape. about that. I mean, man, um, I would, I, you know, God. But the Turners were my, you know, they, they were basically uh, my rabbi. You know, they walked me through everything that's going to happen. I kept wanting to quit my own show, which was also on NBC at the time, which was Tom Rhodes' show. Um, because I wasn't the and showrunner. Show the teacher. Yeah. Who was the... Uh, Stephen Tobolowsky. Yes. Ron Glass. But who was the who was also with you was uh, David Himmelfarb? Am I correct? It was Peter Noah. Peter Noah. Peter okay. Noah was the showrunner, and I had a partner, Jennifer Heath, at that moment. Yes, she's which, terrific. Who, who you also know is a comic. Yeah, um, major major uh, TV writer, yeah. producer. So, uh, but the show, I felt Tom, I felt like I was letting Tom down by not being able to control it. I, I and it's terrible to sit next to, to ride shotgun on a thing that you know sort of you you want to take the reins on and i couldn't and i kept wanting to quit and the turners were like you can't quit your own show because even if you come back to third rock nbc the next time or whoever you go to is going to go yeah but he walked See, now away you from could do it now you could just do the yeah show now i can walk away year. whatever no but you could do both shows people do two shows now. yeah well, i know it's, it's crazy it's all different now. it's so because you're only doing 12 episodes or something or 15 or... well that's why i was doing 25 a year on 70s that's insane that's how you get to 200 in eight years. Yes. You know? Um, so, well, Carsey Warner, uh, the Turners knew I had created my own show. I wasn't the showrunner, but they knew I was, th they believed in me. Um, Carsey Warner said, we, after the so ice for storm. For folks at home, so they don't know inside baseball here, Carsey Warner is Roseanne, is, is uh, uh, Grace Under Fire, Cosby. I mean, all these re very major, major. They would find the most difficult comedian that was, that was a problem to work with and that, that everybody wanted to fire once they work with them, and then they'd give them a show. <laughs> that was the, yeah, they... It just they, seemed like it, didn't it? They always hung around at 70s because nobody was a problem. There were no divas there. No, there was nobody was most, making life was, miserable. There was nobody banning them from the set. It was the most uh, kind of co cohesive, What was easy, it like? What was it, what was it like to be on the show that was so, so popular? You I know, mean, at the moment, I don't know great. that I ever realized what was happening.
uh, because it's almost like, because honestly, 25 a year, it's not hard, but you work all the time, you oh, know? Yeah. But we still, I will say that as a showrunner, we all went home and had dinner almost every night at home. Wow. We left at seven because I moved the run through up to one because the actress would so come in at 5.30 in the morning or 6 o'clock. Well, it's, it's when you do a sitcom producers. in front of an audience, you do a, uh, first, the first day you do a table read. Table. Which means all the actors get around and you get to read with each other. And then the writers decide what works and what doesn't. And a lot of times, really good writers will let the actors work it out. And, and really crazy writers will get rid of their great, fabulous jokes right there and then because someone didn't read something right which is probably the most insane way to work. That's why I don't like sitcoms to work on them. They're so frightening. I didn't do them that way. As a comic, oh, I believed in what we all kind I, of wrote, and I stuck to that. I, I didn't do rewrites. Um, I didn't do alter alts, they call them, alternative lines during the taping that night. Never. Mm -hmm. Didn't okay. do it. And so um, if I thought something's it's good... because what you're doing is you're doing a joke for the audience in the room, and you're not doing a joke for the country. Mm -mm. And you're deciding that this, that the audience in this room who came is you know which is probably a hundred people. It was three hundred. Oh, is it three hundred? Oh yeah. God, some of the, it seems like is it really three hundred? Huge studio. Our studio was well, the Roseanne studio. Had been the Mary Tyler Moore studio. We were in that studio. So, so what, to me, it's like so. What wow. was it like? What was it like? Because Mary Tyler Moore did a uh, a couple came of episodes, on, yeah. didn't she? Well, she was the uh, worked in a television station that Mila worked in. And we also had Johnny so Fever. Oh, well, I mean, obviously, Howard uh, from WKRP ran the radio station that Laura Prepon worked on, Donna. Uh -huh. Because, you know, when they're like, we want stunt casting, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to get Charo. And I did. Because my idea of stunt casting was, look, this is Charo was in stunt casting for even in the shows that she was on. It's 1970-something, right. so I had Lyle Wagner, I have Paul Anka, I have, you know, to uh -huh. me... But Mary Tellermore was the one for me right, that went crazy. That's yeah. when I started to discover your show, honestly, because I was a major, major Mary Tellermore fa show fan. And then when she did Ordinary People, I was like in. Yeah. I was in forever. That was... Uh, th that and you was... gave her a job, honestly, when she couldn't get a job. Really? You know, those days she was not being offered things. It was in the last, you know, 10 years or so, or I guess, of her life, you know, where it was much harder for a woman who's over a certain age. And she was guest starring on TV, you know. I worked uh, on Third Rock with Elaine Stritch. Ah, Stritchy! So imagine that. You know, you oh. ever see the sketch on the Big Gay Sketch Show where somebody plays Elaine Stritch and, and Elaine Stritch plays a greeter at, at Walmart? Oh, no. That's brilliant. It's, if anybody needs right now, they should be going to their computer and watching the, and getting away from our show. I don't even care for a minute <laughs> and watching this. It's the funniest sketch you've ever seen. Uh, uh, Nicole, uh, I'm going to say it wrong. P A P Plantain, I think is her name. See, Plantain. that's it's like off the beaten path, and you're like, look, you either get this or you don't. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do what we want, and we hope you come to us. And if you don't, well, you know, you don't. What was it like to work with John Lithgow? Uh, it's brilliant. And that was uh, recently. he was tremendous, and I love John Lithgow. And uh, the great thing about what John did, because I didn't, who wants to leave Third Rock, you know? Um, but I I'd, I'd started this thing, and uh, I was almost thinking that '70s would be a, a short film that I could use to get to the next place. Because I never thought they'd do a show about pot and kids smoking pot. I never thought they would. And so I had. Uh, and John, you know, I worked with him forever. I love John. And John uh, said, I'm going to come to your table read for that show you're doing. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. You know, French, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt came off of, Who, did off you, of did Third you, did Rock. You know how, did you I, have any I, idea? I did, actually, and I'll tell you a story about Joseph. But um, So John came to the first table read of the pilot. He sat right behind me. Very comforting for me to have John. Because I, I, all these people, aside from Kurtwood. Are you being sarcastic or something? No, no, Seriously. I'm totally serious. I am too. I work with him on Love is Strange, the film he did with, and with, uh, with uh, uh, Alfred Molina. Fred yeah. Molina. And I, they were the couple it, losing their place. Uh, and yes. they, yeah. And I got to tell you, the minute I met him, because I was so nervous, I'm, do I'm talking through the whole scene. I play the officiant at a wedding, I play their friend. They're getting married. I have all the lines, I have two pages of lines. And in a film, that's a long time yeah. to talk. And 
that's it. And Marissa Tomei is there, and the guy Harriet Harris is there. Who won a Tony and Oscar, Tony, Emmy, nominate, and 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 John. The minute I met him, I went like this. <sighs> yeah, I'm fine. He, he's and then uh, Fred is a big goofball, and I w that was it. He he relaxed me at that table Didn't he? because That's he was exactly what I mean. And even at Third Rock, I always believed because John's there. I knew to believe, and um, and some actors elevate your weak stuff so high that you just are so or grateful. Some, let's take it this way, Mark Brazil, you know of that '70s show with 200 episodes. Maybe they get you, and then maybe they lift off the page what was in your head. That's what happens. Well, John was. Yeah. That's what happens because you're brilliant. I mean, well, I, you know, eight years on a show with 200 episodes. Oh, I only did five years. Oh, you only did five. Yeah, and I consulted the last three, which is just oh, word for here's some checks. I drop by, um, and say, "Great job." <laughs> it was just like ridiculous. You know, television is. But so John is at the pilot. Let me, just, let me just go kill myself in the other room, and I'll be right back. And I'm, and it's, and it's happening, and the pilot's happening, and they're reading it, and the Turners and I had, uh, you know, we'd each written uh, seven scenes, uh, twenty-one scenes in the pilot, just worked out that way. The three of us each wrote scenes, and my scene was the three hundred and sixty, which became uh, about smoking dope. You know, that was the one. I'm John sitting behind me. It's going really well, and I'm, I'm like how can it be going so well and then john kicks me in my ass through the chair and i turn around and he goes it's so good like that and i was like wow. yeah, that's all exactly that's, that's, that's talk. exactly what he, and i was like it might be good this might be good right, take, we're going to take a break we're going to be right back with mark brazil here on absolutely jason stewart we'll be right back please don't change the channel what's the thing you said what, uh, don't you And it's uh, Mary Carey, of course, politically naughty with Mary Carey. I'm always naughty. I'm always politically. My behavior is always politically, politically na naughty. I'm never politically correct. Dr. Dr. Drew, Drew hi. <laughs> oh, I'm so yeah, so are you. all teary-eyed, doctor. I know. She wished she could live at rehab. <laughs> <laughs> but only if Dr. Drew's there. Obviously, sure. plus one, like, you know, this little too groping might be inappropriate, but I like the flirting. Well, and when I, I, when I walked in, you shoved my head in your <laughs> No! Are you <laughs> Get politically naughty with Mary Carey, Mondays at 4 p.m. I start. Hi, I'm Moxie. And I'm Nicole. And we're the ladies of Suicide, Suicide Girls, Girls radio. radio, the world's leading BYOB radio show. Pour a glass of your favorite tipple and tune in on Wednesday nights between 8 and 9 p.m. as we discuss life, liberty, and the pursuit of free nipples. Just flash it would be kind of funny, wouldn't it? People think flashing your tits is easy, right? And it's actually kind of hard. Hi, I'm Vicki Abelson. Who the fuck is Vicki Abelson? Hello. <laughs> I wrote a book called Don't Jump. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and my fucking mother. Not my mother, Andy Stone's mother. Andy Stone is my heroine. And she was addicted to everything pretty much except heroin. Oh my God. Oh yes. She just totally captures the excitement of, of rock stars. And famous athletes and famous comedians. Sort of an insider's view from the outside. The warmth and wit of Vicky's writing knocked me out. In, in a good way, not, not like Cosby. Too soon? Don't jump. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and my fucking mother. Damn, that was going to be the name of my book. Vicky wrote a book? Vicki Abelson's long-awaited new book, Don't Jump, is finally here. Don't miss it. Who the fuck is Vicki Abelson? So, 
I keep saying, you know, that I had this visceral reaction to you on the show. Like I knew you, like there was something, like you did something really nice for me or you did something, because I was just saying that I was doing comedy when I knew you, I was in the closet then, I was not out. Steve Moore was a good friend of ours, uh, Lois Bromfield, who I still talk to. She lives in Germany, you know, yeah. with the woman she's married to for a million years. And she still does comedy. I don't even know how she does it in Germany because she doesn't speak German very well. And um, uh, who else? Oh, so many Dor people. Dor Carrie Stay Snow. The, Dor Stay the Biker. Dor Stay the... Which is... I don't know where she got that. Nothing like so, her. You know, the reason I probably made it as a comic, because I started the comedy store. Oh, yeah. I was a doorman. Which is, is also full circle. I'll tell you a story about For the those at home, being a doorman was something of a, a position that you wanted to get as a comedian to get in there. You I thought to. I was too good for that. Is that I knew I wasn't. Um, oh, no. So, so in, in La Jolla. And so uh, I can remember the first time, I'm an open mic guy who works the door. I had quit a job selling cars, making a ton of money. So your story is sort of on uh, I'm Dying Up Here. Uh, Stephen uh, plays Stephen uh, uh, Guarino plays the guy who becomes the salesman, and he's sort of he has a kid and a wife, and he's it's sort of your story in a sense. Yeah, I sold cars from the time I was nineteen through about twenty four, and I was doing open mic nights, and I was at a dealership, and I made like fifty grand a year in the eighties, early eighties, wow. which was a ton of money. It's like two hundred grand now. Yeah, so I'm like, and I'm a kid, and I've been doing open mic nights, and the manager of the dealership. I'm like, look, I think these people, I had a customer, I said, I think they're flakes, I should, I'm supposed to be at the comedy store at nine something, I, I, can you just finish it? And he got really mad at me, because he was like, look, I don't want to hear about the comedy. He goes, that's, that's a, a hobby. This is your career, you can't do both. And I said, and, I, and not in a mean way, but I realized, he's right, I gotta commit, and I quit. Wow. And I really did. I quit. And I That's thought, well, guts. if I got to sell cars later, I'll figure it out. I went to the store, did my set, told Kelly Grant, who's the manager, hey, I just quit my job. She goes, well, you should check IDs here because you seem to really like it. And so I did. And then so you I, went from making 200, oh, two, 200 a week, 250 yeah, whatever Yeah, which is it was. like $200,000 a year to checking mics at the comedy store. Uh, rather, checking... Uh, um, oh, answering uh, the phone. Answering the phone, checking driver's license to see who's illegal and not. And what do they pay you? A couple oh, dollars? 250 maybe a An week. hour. A week was the two dollars, 250 bucks a week. I made 1000 a month. So I went from 50 to, to about twelve grand a, a year. But I remember Louis Anderson was the first guy who took myself and my friends out for dinner and bought, because he knows we're open micers, and I was like, well, oh, he's on television. And it was like a guild, where they just accepted you into it. Oh, meaning, yeah, you, it, well, it's like you a know, brotherhood. Kathy Ladman, Carrie Kathy. Snow, Lois love, Bromfield, love them all. Steve, Steve Moore, God Taylor Bromfield. Negron, Taylor. they all treated us like we were like them. And I was like, oh, my God. That's what they I'm not that's worthy, what they don't but... Get when they, I watch the show, I'm... Uh, dying up here that's my experience of comics it's opposite it's very antagonistic so but yes and we're not no we are there there, there are some comics east coast I, you know, has some of that so, or just in general you know there are you know jeff wayne when i first knew now he's very friendly with me it was just impossible Big Daddy. A of, yeah you know a couple of people were and, and i love jeff now but he was a little you know you know rat-a-tat-tat all the time with me and there was freddie asparagus god bless him he used to grab my ass all the time but people, I, you know, I found some of the best friends over the years to be comedians and actors. And they always say that, you know, who have been so supportive of me. Well, Steve Odeker, another guy. Oh, great Who guy. was such a delightful person. And he was so brilliant. And yet he treated us, open micers, and guys who had five good minutes, so wonderful. And um, so, yeah, that part, you know, I never in my life thought when somebody got something i was happy for them because i always felt like oh there's so much here and i still feel that way there's so many opportunities so much money there's so much that you can get that just because somebody else gets something which i think is on that show yeah, too but the only it thing, doesn't take away from you the only thing is is that you think when in that, this is an honest thing is is if you're not working you think i just want to come along can i just come along can i just sit in the back of the car that's the only thing when you you know when there's so much time between jobs. Here's or, what scares me. When you're me on about a show that. with so long, it's a different experience. What I always felt, not that I was ever asked, and I and I wasn't, was I always felt like the outlaws could have potentially been the worst place you could wind up in Sam's group. Outlaws of comedy was Sam uh, Kinnison, uh, Carl Lebeau, 
Alan Steven. Alan Steven. Uh, Jimmy Schubert. Uh, and the Mitchell gr- Walters. And there was a couple girls that sort of hung on. Tamayo. Uh, Tamayo Tsuki and Martha Jane Uran. Martha Jane. Yeah. Because I always felt like now you're, you're always going to be a part of this thing. You're not going to be the thing. I was, you're not going to be I Sam. I wouldn't even get those guys. I was frightened. Sam, you know, I will tell you how I met. Do you want to hear? Oh, yeah. Okay. So Sam, I think I've told the story before. I'll tell it again. Sam came down to La Jolla. My sister was there. That means we have one minute. Okay. My, my sister was in La Jolla. Take She's time, pregnant. Man with my niece who is now a doctor pediatrician that's how long ago it was uh sam gets uh he has to follow robin robin, robin williams but yeah fresh you know the mort guy who's kills. The, who's the biggest in the biggest star on television right now yeah it's 86 maybe yeah. 84 i don't even remember but and it's that's like, when there were three channels but the hbo special for rodney hadn't come out yet nobody knows who sam is it's an open mic night in la jolla I got bumped for those two guys, and so I'm dying like, oh, God, help me. I have to go on after Robin and this guy who everybody's talking about. Sam gets heckled the entire time. There's a group of kids, students from USD or some school, preppy, you know, uh-huh. sweaters around the neck. Sam gets off stage. They call him Mr. Fatty. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so Sam just bombs, gets off stage. I well, didn't know that, that he would either kill or bomb. Right. He was not a consistent act. No. And, Great, and, sweet and man. And the fame really made it, like, once Rodney's special came out, he's huge. He's good to go. Oh, yeah. Although I did see him at Universal with a group of Midwesterners bombed. So Sam is walking off stage. MC's bringing me up. I'm walking up to Sam, and I shake his hand regardless. And uh, he stops at that table of kids, and he goes, Hey, you guys, did you like the show? Did you enjoy Mr. Fatty's show? <laughs> and they're like... Uh, F you. And he goes, no, 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 please, I don't want you to have a bad feeling about what happened tonight. So I'll tell you what, let me get you a drink. Drink's on me. He tips the table onto them. One hand, tips it off. It's on. Now I'm not going on stage. I'm in a fight because somebody's got Sam by the neck. He's got somebody by the neck going like this to his head. We had just met. So that's how Sam and I knew each other because he was like, Another day at the comedy club. He was never, he never forgot that Willie Parsons, everybody who was at the door working that night, we got in a full on fight. But Tyler he was Chip. a very loyal guy. He was. I met him at Harvey Lambeck's comedy workshop and I, him and Carla, I thought they were funny, but I thought they were the strangest people I'd ever meet. Strangest guys. I thought this guy's never going to make it. No one's ever going to get him. <laughs> we'll be back in just a second uh, here on Absolutely Jason Stewart. Please stay with us. from home and you're on the street you've been ripped off you've been used and you could be killed there is a way out there is a way off the street not tomorrow but now runaway hotline will get you off the street call runaway hotline toll free anytime day or night runaway hotline gets your message to those who care call now and get off the street I start. Hi, I'm Moxie. And I'm Nicole. And we're the ladies of Suicide, Suicide Girls, Girls Radio, Radio, the world's leading BYOB radio show. Pour a glass of your favorite tipple and tune in on Wednesday nights between 8 and 9 p.m. as we discuss life, liberty, and the pursuit of free nipples. I just flash it would be kind of funny, wouldn't it? People think flashing your tits is easy, right? And it's actually kind of hard. I like to sing, dance, pretend, and I like to have fun, 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 fun,
Well, one of my producers here has given me this great list that I just am thanking. Jake, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for watching. Tanya Ward, love her. Layden David, thank you. My good friend, oh, Robin McDonald. Robin is the funniest person I've ever met. She tells the greatest stories. Karen West, wonderful, brilliant actress. Thanks for subscribing. Love her. You, you guys just saw her on one of the Chicago shows. I think it was Chicago Fire. Mark, uh, is that Knob? How do you say nope. that? What? I think it's Nope. Nope. He opened for me in Bakersfield, the Red Line, a million years ago. Was I out then? I don't even remember. And Jocelyn Wright, my friend. I love her. She's a friend of mine. Wonderful, wonderful actress. Wonderful. Uh, these are just great people watching the show. Thank you all for like and all the likes, the tons of likes. Thank you. I want to hear the story about Gordon Levitt. I, I and, uh, and did you know that he was going to be that he was going to be like a major movie star? I love what the way he handled his career. I don't think career. anybody could know how huge he was going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was always a brilliant actor and um, a child actor on a show playing a ninety-year-old man, which, which is, is kind of brilliant. Yeah, you know, and he was brilliant. It's the original Benjamin Button show, right? He was a uh, uh, probably ten year old old man. So mm -hmm. Joseph, we called him Joey at the time. Now he's Joseph Gordon Levitt. Um, we we're very close from Third Rock. First season of seventies, I had a show that was basically based on a friend of mine from uh, West New York, where I grew up, who was closeted. Um, because it's a kind of a, a urban farm kind of place at the moment, at that time, when I was in high school. Uh, I wrote an episode of 70s. I didn't write it. It was my story. It was called uh, Buddy's Camaro. Everybody, everybody from my hometown knew what I was saying. So doesn't even matter. I love that title. This uh, character on the show, uh, Eric is complaining about Donna a lot. They're doing a science project together. They're hanging out all the time. Eric has no idea he's gay. Buddy. They're in the Camaro. He's saying, I, I don't know. Eric uh, Topher leans forward. He's like, I don't know if Donna really gets me. Topher, Gr uh, Grace. Topher Grace. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is Buddy. He kisses him on the mouth. Okay, here's why this matters to me. It's, it's, it's 2000 or... It's on the air in like 99 or 2000. It's the first primetime kiss between two men. No, no. Yes, no. it is. No, I think it was, if I'm right. On a sitcom in primetime. I'm qualifying it. I'm okay, still saying. I think 30 something, but I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, that's our drama. Right. Oh, and also, that was the weird thing. Picket Fences, coincidentally, had Stephen Tobolowski and Chris Smith as uh, serial killer lovers. I done uh, that shows that, with that both is of them. the only way that, that Stephen Tobolowski could get Kirkwood Smith. That is the only way <laughs> because he is just way too hot for Stephen. And I love Stephen and I know Stephen. So please, if you're listening, because he probably doesn't listen to my show, but I listen to his show all the time. But uh, that's the only way you get somebody hot is if you're a serial killer. Look it up. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. First because kiss? honestly, I believe it's the first one. And I was The boys are looking right now. Right now, the boys are looking. Are you I guys was, looking? Uh, first kiss on a primetime sitcom. Here's the, here's the other coincidental thing. I was friends with uh, uh, Max and Dave because they wrote on the Dennis Miller show. They created Will and Max Grace. Max and Dave. Oh, uh, Max. Cohen and Munchnik. Yes. We see each other at... The creators Ma of Will and Grace. So inside baseball. I'm sorry. People are, you know, I like to tell so people don't. We see each other in either New Orleans or Las Vegas at NAPTI. And they said, did you, have, did you guys have someone kiss on your show? Did you guys have Topher, did Topher kiss some, a guy on your show? I said, yeah. And they, they were like, ah, oh, because NBC was like, no. They would not let Will kiss somebody on the show at that moment in time. It's crazy. And, set, and Fox, of all people, it was a fight, but still, we won that fight. We got to do it. Somebody said that Dawson's Creek, I think, did it first. Our and I was drama, like, our drama. Uh, I, my, I believe that uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Topher, I believe that was the first one ever on primetime television. God, they should have married. They would have made good kids. I would think so. <laughs> Definitely. I'd so, like to see those kids. Well, I'd like to see the, the creation of the kids. Uh, okay. So tell me what you're doing stand-up now. Where are you working? Oh, well, you know, I go to the Ventura Harbor Comedy Club a lot because I know Randy, Randy Lucas. Randy Lucas's room. And he just put um, I you're really did, enjoying it now. Though. I love it. Yes, 
Sutter had me do a show at the Laugh Factory with him. Uh, Wendy Liebman put me at Vitello. Some, um, and um, that was pretty exciting. Because it's, it's like doing open mic nights is great, and you can no, say what but you I want, but being in a room that's not sold what, out, Yeah, wow. Wendy's show is about, in, it's about older people. Yeah. And which is sort of nice. Because I've done her show too a couple times. I love Wendy. She's been yeah, on she's show. tremendous. She's a dear friend. We all we're like I'm at six to, uh, degrees of you. We know all the same people. And w so, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do? Next? Movie wise. Wait, I want to tell you about the Dorman, the comedy Dorman thing. The working at the comedy store. Oh yeah, Dorman. I went to see Al Franken. Al Franken was at uh, the Wallace. Was he doing stand up? He did an evening speaking with Mark Maron. Ah. Oh. Mark Marin and I had never met. Which have is you done weird. a show? I haven't. I have. Uh, but for whatever reason, Mark had the thing with Sam. He moved back to Boston. I moved to L.A. We missed each other. Mm -hmm. And then, for whatever reason, he, he's a middle, I'm a middle, he's a headliner, I'm a headliner. We never got booked together. We see each other at the thing. He, we know a lot of the same people. We're talking. Jay Mandiam brought me there. He's a... Uh, comedy store doorman did i middle for you or did i headline for you you headlined i middled wow. or opened even i don't even remember it was a long because it's ago. i don't know it's it, 80s oh okay because i don't remember yeah so i don't remember half of the, uh, the people i, I don't with. i don't remember what club i was in if people it, talk to me about something i go uh, oh yeah so oh, we're, that was we're so in much that fun. room it's al franken senator franken god uh and is mark, he terrific is uh, he's, he's amazing he's the best so uh mark Marin, jay mandy after the fact, we realized all four of those people were comedy store doormen. Al Franken was a comedy store doorman? Oh my With God. Tom Davis in 73. So, Man. Like, wow. But you talk about degrees of separation. We all know the same people. We all grew up at the same time. We all moved in circles. And you either, um, like, I lived with Kevin West. I don't know if you know Kevin. Oh, yeah. Kevin, Kevin West, gay Kevin West or straight gay Kevin, Kevin West? West? Oh, yeah. How, so, how, he's terrific. He, He's one of he the most would do brilliant, crazy hysterical stand people. Up. And crazy. He was like a, a, some sort of slithering uh, snake thing yeah. that he did. It was, it was hysterical. He was so talented. And yeah. he's like a world-class tennis player, too. What? Yes. Did not know that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, King of commercials. King Never of commercials. Never saw somebody get so many commercials in my life. Yeah, he, he had the right look. He was like the Sandy Duncan of his career. <laughs> Do you remember she was on all the commercials in yes. the 70s? That is so, that made me sound so fucking old. She did you vanilla, vanilla cookies, I believe. And uh, uh, Trisket, that's right, uh, Wheat Thins. And tampons. Yes, and, and, and the bride, something with the, with the, the, the under, under, under with the bride and running around or something. And then she gets a series called Funny Face and then her eye falls out. It was so sad. <laughs> <laughs> but she did have a funny face after that. Yes, so. she did. And, she, and became a big Broadway gal. Yeah. Big, big Broadway guy. I think she was nominated for a Tony. Because um, I never know to make fun of anybody without saying all the great things they've done, too, because a lot of people have done great things. Um, are you going to create another show? Yeah. I have two. Yeah, I have two um, pilots that I'll probably pitch over the next couple are you weeks. Do, are you doing sitcoms or are you doing single cameras? Single camera comedies. Ooh, so this is cool. Yeah. You don't like uh, it? No, I do like it. I just, sitcoms are not really what they. It's, I think it's, it's just, just a different medium, hard. and not many people are interested in beyond. It's with. hard because it's it, it it seems old school, and I think if you really look at um, and a, a lot of these shows that they're doing, that that are sitcoms now, they almost seem parodies of them. Like when you, right. Hot in Cleveland didn't have that kind of you know where people would just stop and talk, you know, on a sitcom. You wouldn't go. You know, honey, I, this is what's happening. And then say that, you know, they would just stop. And it was so presentational. If you look at I Love Lucy, or you look at the beginning of sitcoms, they didn't do that. Somehow it got into this bad way of acting. And I don't think it has to be like that. I, I thought, um, I always thought that um, four cameras were theater. And it was, uh, I, the thing I loved about four camera was if, if it's funny, you'll prove it in front of an audience as opposed to films which yeah films are obviously very funny but i think that focus groups replace the audience and oh, i think it's a every terrible, way, terrible in every thing. way shape or form it's like it's like saying just the people that are watching your show in the audience that night is is if they love it 
and the whole country is going to love it. Yeah, so it's very, indicative no. of a larger untruth, actually. I think so. Well, I'm very excited to see what you do next. And Thanks. I will we'll talk later, and I'll see if I can, we can hook you up with some stuff. Jason, just so you know, we have Luke. And uh, what was the other show you said? What, that They said it was the first kiss? Was that Dawson's Creek? Is the first kiss was, was Dawson's Creek. No, it, actually, you guys are on for all prime time because you were 1998. Dawson's Creek was 2000. So ah, right. I so this means that I have to have a kiss on. That'd be your last gay kiss. <laughs> or, I, your, how, about, how about I could be your continuous gay kiss? Well, you how know, about I play a straight person and don't kiss anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Being married, it's like, well, like you know, no matter what, it's it's uh, she she might care. Oh, She's not, actually, what, she oh wait, wait, it's not you that I'm going to be kissing. Oh, well, what the hell am I here for then? Because that's ridiculous. God, what a tease. That's why you didn't make it. <laughs> now do I have to say all your great stuff? Because Yeah, because you, yeah, you just, one great thing, just one great thing. Uh, the Birth of a Nation. Did you see the movie? I did, of Oh, course. yeah, we talked about it, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is, it's incredibly exciting. You are, uh, and you could play a very scary bad man. Oh, that's all and I do now. That's Jeez. pretty great, though. Yeah. I'm that's a, a great that's a great career the bad man's always more interesting oh i think so like i was saying i'm watching now uh uh deadwood and you know cock -sucks -a -cock -a -cock -a -cock -a -cock that was my f david milch david milch is from buffalo and i'm from buffalo i want to know i want fontana is from buffalo a lot of writers came out of buffalo diane english came out of buffalo i think this one camera thing is going to be great for you because it's going to take you to the next creative place where you're supposed to be yeah and i'm very excited to see what you do next and i can't for taking the time well, to do my show. Thanks for having me. Really, so much. Even though you didn't kiss me. I don't, I'll kiss fine. you. You want me to kiss you right now? I don't now? care. You'll be the first person I ever No, because now show. it'll be forced. <laughs> and sweaty. I don't want to. <laughs> I think you'll be the first person I kissed on my show, though. All right, this is uncomfortable. So we... <laughs> buddy, I'll talk to you next week. Bye. I don't know what to say. We're going to French now. Oh, God.